Hello and welcome to this Accountancy Age webinar, Seed to Series C, Tips for Business Funding. I'm Michael McCoy, your host today. We are in an age of uh, superabundant capital, with sky-high valuations and ever-increasing fund sizes. It's obvious that venture capital investors are aggressively competing to back the next big thing. That said, it's a daunting proposition for businesses looking for VC funding. Recent research into the startup community by Early Metrics revealed that while 83% of firms set out to raise funds, 44% failed to raise seed to Series A funds in the 12, 12 months following their audit. 53% of the startups surveyed uh, raised less than the, they thought they would, and just 1 in 10 managed to raise the exact amount they were aiming for. So getting VC funding right is complex and crucial in equal parts. So with me here to this, today to discuss some of the problems firms may face, as well as some of the solutions, is Mars Ayad, EMEA Director, Private Equity, Net, NetSuite. And Dan Summers, Managing Partner of Foundry Capital. So perhaps just to get us started, uh, you guys could fill our listeners in briefly on your experience in the market we're looking at. It's Mars. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Mars. I lead NetSuite's private equity venture capital practice across Europe. Um, for those of you who aren't aware of NetSuite, NetSuite offers um, an end-to-end 100% cloud business productivity platform um, for companies, so running essentially the back office. Um, We work directly with venture capital uh, and venture capital-backed companies, and really with NetSuite, we allow them to leapfrog spreadsheets and entry-level products and really start building and professionalizing on the most deployed business productivity software globally. We have about 16,000 organizations running on NetSuite um, across the globe. Um, And whilst we offer kind of financials, you know, NetSuite has a solution for ERP, supply chain, professional service automation, CRM, e-coms. You know, offering companies the benefit to full visibility across organizations um, and allowing them to kind of professionalize from a reporting compliance um, and a global presence you know, from a back office perspective. So, you know, in my role, I've been, I've been with Oracle NetSuite for about two years now. Um, lucky, lucky enough to meet, you know, probably not an exaggeration, say hundreds of VCs and entrepreneurs um, at different stages of their kind of growth cycle. Um, and hopefully be able to share with you some insights, tips, um, and anecdotes that I have um, picking up from investors and entrepreneurs alike who have kind of gone through the journey already. Wonderful. Thank you. And Dan? Yeah, hi. So I'm Dan Summers, Managing Partner of Boundary Capital. We're an early stage VC, really focusing on B2B technology is really our sweet spot. We do invest outside that, but that's really our core. The areas include life sciences, uh, SaaS with an innovation of uh, a particular as opposed to just a, a web tool, um, and also engineering and electronics um, as well. The model that we have, um, we've all come from entrepreneurial backgrounds ourselves. Um, so the model we have and we be- passionately believe in um, is that the early stage uh, businesses need a lot of help, and we have something called a venture model. What that means is that we work with the entrepreneurs that we are looking to invest in to identify an individual who can really help that founder team to make a difference, be it opening doors. It could be a technical challenge. It's mostly commercial ones. And they, they invest with us alongside our investments uh, at the same price, but they also take an active seat on the board, for example, exec chairman or some kind of uh, role there, uh, helping the, the CEO um, so they're not necessarily an angel per se, although they do end up investing, but it's to help align interests of all parties and de-risk and make it successful for clearly our investors, but it's what we call selfish altruism in the sense of our success is really the, the entrepreneur's success and this business success. We're all aligned. Wonderful. Uh, I think we've got a really good, uh, really good panel today, and uh, thank you both for joining me. Uh, and to your audience, um, you'll be able to submit questions throughout today's webinar, um, but if you'd like to do so, you can see on your screen um, on On24 how to do that, um, and we'll hopefully come back to them after, we, after our discussion. So perhaps a good way to get, get started, um, we could walk through the various funding rounds. Um, Dan, perhaps um, maybe we could turn to you just to fill us in on the, uh, the seed and early rounds, and then Mars, if, we can, if you could assume the mantle for the later stages. Dan, over to you. Yeah, so thank you. So just a quick overview. I mean, one thing I would say is that there's no real sort of, there's just a continuous spectrum of funding rounds. Everyone has these different buckets um, and and everyone talks about a valley of death and that they're always on the valley of death and they only need to get to the next level, etc. And there is some truth to that, but I think there's a lot of blurring of the lines, really. You know, businesses are in the stage they're in. 
Um, uh, but but, uh, but fun, and funders have preferences. Funders have ideal check size, ideal preference of stage, and etc. So the stage that we prefer um, and that we come in at would be pre-seed and seed, let's call it that, uh, before Series A. Again, question mark, what is Series A? And I think Mars is a better place to answer that. Um, but essentially, let's say anything up to a million pounds sort of raise. Um, and it's really when, from our point of view, we are looking, we know things are broken, uh, in inverted commas. It's just that the things that are broken are the things we don't, uh, we, you know, we're excited about the business and the market and, of course, the team. Um, and we are really backing um, a management team um, and uh, to, you know, get to, if you like, a Series A event and then perhaps work with someone perhaps more like Mars would, would know to, to go forward um, from from that level, we'll bring in other investors ourselves. Um, but it's really that sort of difference between getting a business that doesn't really have a scalable product market fit and getting it to the position where, let's say, a Series A funder can look at that and go, yeah, okay, I think that if I just pour money in, and Mars, I'm sure you'll qualify this or challenge me on this, yeah. um, if I pour money in, um, it will just scale, um, as opposed to when we get it, it's more like, well, you know, it's, it, there's some revenue, but um, do we know there's a repeatable business, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, of course, there's, there's lots of shades of gray here, but that's my sort of take on those early sort of stages, a um, few hundred up to a million pounds. Thanks, Dan. And I can, I can add to that just from my experience, the, the very early rounds. Really, I think, you know, the overarching purpose of seed funding is to help companies work out their product and their audience, right? So... Typically, seed funding will allow entrepreneurs to build and launch a, a very early iteration of their product and test out the assumptions that they've used, um, the assumptions on the market, the user base, and so on. So it should you, allow you to expand the team beyond the initial founding members so you can start thinking about the exec team that you're working with. Um, and Dan, you, 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 know, you can probably provide more color on this, but when, you know, when you're pitching, the focus is undoubtedly on the product idea, the vision for the company, and perhaps you know, most importantly, uh, the enthusiasm, drive, expertise, and talent behind it, because you know when you're investing this early, you ultimately I think you're backing people, uh, and I think Dan, you, you kind of reiterated that as well. Yeah. With Absolutely. I, I guess no, when yeah, you start, no, yeah, when you I guess when you start thinking about Series A and that next le liquidity event, um, so the core product offering, the market's kind of figured out. You're starting to acquire new customers. But maybe your business model may not be 100% clear, and especially kind of thinking about monetization at scale, that might not be 100% worked out. I think you know Series A funding should kind of be looking to help you work a lot of those questions out. Um, so that includes optimizing the the product, the user base, um, so that a business is really ready to start successfully entering new markets and transacting um, across different channels, right? So. In terms of raising funding, I think, you know, biggest difference, at least from NetSuite's perspective, right, biggest difference between Seed and Series A, when you're going, going, kind of going through diligence, I think Series A is a lot more metric driven um, than potentially Seed, which is a lot more focused on the kind of the talent pool and, and the, the management team and the idea. Um, you know, You've got to be able to have those metrics, be tracking those KPIs over time so you can show where your growths come from, right? Um, you need to be able to really demonstrate, you know, how you're helping your customers in a quantifiable way. So I would just say from a, from a kind of a data perspective, that's really when you start need to th be thinking about, you know, making sure you are tracking the right KPIs, the right metrics, you know where your growth is coming from and so on, because at, at this kind of stage, diligence becomes a lot more in-depth, I think. What I would say from a NetSuite perspective, you know, companies at this stage, when they're running on NetSuite, they look, they need to understand their user base. They need to effectively track their revenues. Um, NetSuite is a platform working directly with um, VC investors at the forefront and they're kind of their, their portfolio companies. Really, we're looking at early stages to lower the commercial barriers for companies to be able to move on to a platform like NetSuite and build off it, right? Um, given that there will be a very aggressive growth rates and targets in the future, you need something that's scalable. Um, so that's what I would start thinking, you know, Series A is all orientated around nailing down that model, um, especially when it comes to monetizing at scale, right? 
Thoughts, Dan? And I, to, Miles, if I, if I just come in on that as well, because I think I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, often you'll hear, this is kind of, I guess we're coming on to tips and things later, but if you've already talked to VCs um, uh, as an entrepreneur, you might get the feedback, oh, come back to us when you've got a million dollar run rate or a million pound run rate or some variation of that on an ARR basis. Um, and some of that's true. Um, and in my opinion, um, some of it is kind of semi-true. And what I mean by that is, you know, people are using that to say, I'm not quite sure that you're ready for Series A anyway. Um, it's not really about the run rate. I know very much lots of Series A people who get very excited about businesses that have passed a lot of the criteria that we've just talked about. Um, and conversely, businesses that have that sort of run rates um, that don't. Um, and I've seen at earlier stage businesses that have that, which I've thought uh, just haven't figured out a lot of stuff yet. You know, they've just either got some consulting business that um, has come in that's managed to, they've managed to monetize with some early software, but they don't really know how to figure stuff out for a more scalable approach. Um, so, you know, there is a lot of gray out there um, and there isn't any kind of right or wrong answer but um, you know, if you if you um, are trying to get into the head of a VC, which I hope is what this call is all about, what what we're both trying to give you is is the mindset that we're trying to make decisions on as VCs for our funds and for our stage and our risk profiles, um, and for you to fit into or, or or try and convince us to fit into the pigeonholes and the reasons why those pigeonholes exist. Absolutely, great. It's, um, some interesting points there. So just, if it might come back to you, Dan, um, just looking at that, well, the other side of the fence there, um, how can a VC really add value? Yeah, so you'll often hear VCs saying we can add value. Frankly, I'm not sure why half of them say that, because it's unnecessary. Um, <laughs> you know, the entrepreneur, frankly, comes to them for the money, um, and um, that should be good enough. Uh, I guess there's this need to, and a passion to differentiate, and maybe from the inside they do, do look different, uh, perhaps more different from the inside than they do from the outside or, or whatever. Um, but I think that the, um, the uh, perhaps I'm a bit tongue-in-cheek, a bit controversial, but the differences are more apparent for the early stage funds. Um, and um, that's because, as we've sort of said, there's just more to do and, and real value uh, you know, the arbitrage that we take the risk on as an early stage fund is that we, we have a higher failure rate, but of the ones that we think we can get to a Series A event, of course, to exit, and we're not obsessed by getting people to Series A events, but as, as a milestone on the way to an exit um, is uh, that, you know, we're, we're getting that extra value. A VC might come in at a sort of, I don't know, 10 or 10 to 15 million pre-money. Uh, we might come in on a half to 2 million pre-money. And so, um, you know, that's the sort of uh, delta that um, we're taking a risk. And, um, so part of that is to help fix the things that are broken, in inverted commas. Um, and, and part of that is actually to identify and to work with entrepreneurs that recognize or that we agree things are broken. Sometimes we get people who come to us and say, we've got all the answers. And at our stage, that's not what we want to hear because it doesn't really sound self-aware. We want confidence. We want um, uh, people who uh, take one and one and make ten. But, um, you know, that sort of awareness of, uh, you know, let's work together and, and a partnership and um, open up the kimono, so to say, um, on, on fixing. Because a lot of the things that will be broken won't be the interesting things of the business. The interesting things are the things which differentiate it, be the, uh, the product, the IP, the, um, the passion of the team uh, in, and expertise in a particular area. So the way that we approach it, as I hinted at the beginning, was this venture model. Um, and it really then, once we've kind of identified, again, this selfish altruism point is really getting to understand the business. Sometimes we spend months with them in advance of getting them funded um, and getting them to an investment ready. And the venturer um, could be someone with usually big, um, a big company and venture experience. To have one without the other is usually, we found, a bit dangerous. Um, if they've got a big comp uh, company um, experience, they have nice connections, um, they might be able to open doors. Because ironically, a lot of entrepreneurs are, say, you know, are saying, I need £300,000 or £500,000, but the most of that is going to go on sales and marketing. Now, for our stage, okay, we like to hear they want to grow the top line, of course, uh, but our answer is if we can find someone that you could actually afford, who can open up doors quicker uh, than just getting in a you know, expensive sales guy, wouldn't that be interesting? And they'll work for free, in inverted commas. 
So, you know, that kind of changes the rules of the game. And, you know, the, clearly we're doing it for our own um, uh, benefit, but uh, it's a nice way to bring value. Um, and, uh, and this is what happens. We bring people who can open doors. As I said, it's not always commercially. There's one business we've invested in um, called uh, Dimag, which is a, a carbon fiber wheels, um, where actually we brought in a very a technical, I mean, he's an entrepreneur, he's a brilliant business guy, um, but he came in more on the technical ticket. Uh, but that's more kind of the exception which proves the rule. M- mostly we're taking technical founders um, and we are applying uh, people with business experience to help open doors. Um, and so, you know, is that valuable? You know, hopefully it is value. Um, I, I think the, problem, the question I pose is, does, matter, does, does value matter later? Um, but Mars will answer that one, I think. <laughs> I think, Dan, I, I agree with a lot of what you've said. I think the drive um, for VCs to differentiate themselves around, around what they kind of are calling value creation or helping or, or supporting their entrepreneurs to create value. I think a lot of that's driven, Mike, you mentioned at the top of, of the call that, hey, we are in a kind of an environment now where VC fundraising hasn't been as health, healthy as this since the financial crisis, right, over a decade ago. So, you know, couple that, Europe's always been a, Europe's always been a key center for for attracting VC funds, right? We have an immensely deep talent pool of entrepreneurs. Um, You know, European cities are connected internationally, very strong infrastructure, very deep capital market. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that drive to differentiate around value creation is because VCs are having to work, perhaps at later stages, but they're having to, uh, to work a lot harder to win their investments, right? Things are a lot more competitive. If you're an attractive business, there'll be a lot of money thrown at you, right? It's about picking the right partner. The two points, to, to what extent that actually happens uh, as opposed to kind of it just being marketing on, on a VC website and actually them being able to help to, to that degree um, will vary from firm to firm. But what I agree with Dan is on kind of two key points, right? Really in the most practical form, early stage investments give entrepreneurs extra runway, right? So if we're saying you've just raised a series A, you're still trying to work out how to scale and monetize a business model. Um, you know, you sh- Series A should be able to give you kind of 18 months of runway to work through those challenges with your investors, right, getting different perspectives um, and kind of work through those challenges. Uh, again, Dan, I agree, you know, VCs aren't there to be a substitute for operational excellence. They, you know, they're not going to be getting involved day to day. And frankly, I don't think a lot of entrepreneurs would want them to, right? But, um, you know, I, I think bringing a different perspective um, being a sounding board um, for a lot of these challenges and having seen others, like you, you kind of talk about the extended network, Dan, I think that's one of the biggest ways they can add values, right? Making sure they're speaking to the right people who have done it before, right? And they've scaled businesses before and can kind of help and mentor them. Um, the other piece that I completely agree with is on the recruitment of talent, right? Um, I think in general, as soon as you kind of close a VC around, you'll find it a lot easier to hire people. Um, the, you know, the key is finding the right people, good people. But, you know, the reason being, funding is a signal, I guess, for business maturity, right, that these companies are on the right path. Um, I think, a, you know, what, joining early stage businesses, you've got also got to be clever about how you incentivize your top talent, right, because you can't necessarily go toe-to-toe with the big beasts if you're going to be in the software sector, for example. Um, so a lot of that will, you know, naturally be around how you kind of structure stock options and so on. Um, but recruiting top talent, you know, if I look at the kind of the top VCs we work with globally, um, you know, that's something they're super hot on, leveraging their, their network of entrepreneurs, founders, CEOs, CFOs who have done it before, putting them in touch, um, helping recruit talent within an organization, not just providing a network, but recruiting talent within an organization. You know, they've got a very... You know, their black book is extensive um, a lot of the time. So, yeah, definitely two, two key value ads that you should be looking for from any investor is, hey, are they going to help you? Are they going to provide that runway as you work through kind of the monetization and the scaling issues and the business model? How are they going to help you with the recruitment piece? Because actually, you know, most entrepreneurs, the biggest ch- challenge is not necessarily funding, right? It's finding the right talent that are going to help them scale the business. That's what, you know... 2008, the key bottleneck for early stage businesses was not financial capital, right? It was attracting, retaining, and motivating key talent. 
in what is a super competitive market in Europe, right? Um, fundraising is never easy. It's painful, you know, many false dawns. But when you're on the ground, I think the biggest challenge is, you know, you're going to spend a lot more time on finding the right people to help you take your organization to the next step, whether that's internationalizing, whether that's new product lines, you know, someone who's been there, done it, and can provide that, that expertise. And I think that's where VC add a lot of value. Wonderful. Just, just one thing um, uh, you both picked up on there um, that I kind of want to want to cut through just to be just to be clear on. So you both mentioned the idea of VC being a being a good sounding board, uh, which obviously um, is crucial value added. But putting putting myself in the position of being um, uh, being a startup, I might have I might have just launched a product that I think is you know kind of the next big thing. Um, well, I might I might think. How much, how much input can these people actually give me? I might just be thinking, I just want their cash. Um, how, how do VCs um, convince um, these smaller or younger firms to actually listen to that um, information? And um, are there any kind of tensions there um, or that you've seen in the past? Um, Mars, maybe I'll come to you with that first. There, you know, there often can be, te- you've got to think like, you know, with a VC, with your investors, a lot of those relationships will last longer than the average marriage in the UK, right? So you spend a lot of time together. You've got to have a, a you know, strong personal relationship um, with these guys that you're working with. Um, the tension is that, you know, there is a very thin red line between being seen to support and enable your entrepreneurs and to be seen to be mandating what they should be doing. Ultimately, right, like we said, like Dan said, you know, at these early stages, the investment's more in the management team and the idea, right? So it's, you know, they're they're the guys with the vision. They're the ones that are going to be doing the day-to-day. But that said, you know, it is absolutely helpful to have someone, you know, the mix around your board boardroom, to have different perspectives, to have someone come and challenge you, for example, around certain assumptions. I guess one kind of concrete example of that is, you know, VCs, investors, advisors can help entrepreneurs change their mindset slightly, right? Because, you know, if you're going from an independent startup to a VC-backed growth business, you know, that's a major milestone in the organization's journey. Um, Often demands a change in the management approach, for example. Founders need to move from kind of the scrappy, lean, tight, mindset to a more expansive mindset, right? Um, so really, they've got to fundamentally change the way they work as a leader um, and the way they approach the business. I think VCs have a big role in helping the founders and entrepreneurs along that journey, right? And again, a lot of that comes around introducing them to their peer network um, so they can speak to people that have been in a similar situation um, and have successfully scaled businesses. There, there can be tension, right? So it is a thin line. Um, I think the most successful firms that I've seen who, who, who do like to get involved on the operational side kind of run a, a bit of a pool model in that, hey, you know, they've got a dedicated team. They can help, whether it's around strategy, pricing, internationalization, whatever the kind of the investment thesis may be. But, you know, they make it known to their execs, their CFOs, their entrepreneurs, that they're available and they're willing and ready to help, right? You know, it's really on the business then to kind of pull those resources in and to bring them into the conversation if that's what they want. That's the best model I've found, I think, um, as opposed to the other way where, you know, you don't have many super prescriptive VCs, um, but you find it a lot more in the States, at least in Europe. um, I think investors are a lot more hesitant, I think, to to kind of push across that red line. Great. Thanks, Dan. Dan, I wonder if you've anything to add to that. Yeah, so um, there was a couple of thoughts provoked from that one. So um, the first thing is, you know, if you are looking for your funding or more funding, um, check out the backgrounds of the people um, who, who, who were running your VCs. So as cynical as I obviously came across um, about value add, <laughs> um, you know, there are different people running VCs of different backgrounds, different flavors. Um, there are entrepreneurs um, who've been on your side of the fence. There are people who've come through um, accountancy. There are people who've come through finance, um, or generally M&A, um, and, um, and people who've come from operations uh, in, in businesses, um, might be a corporate VC. Um, 
and that 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 can affect mindset as well as the remit, you know, how, um, of the of, of the people um, as well as their their remit. So, you know, clearly, if you've got your begging bowl out and you need the cash, then you need the cash. Um, if you have choices um, and you uh, you know think more long term, I'm also going to kind of reveal something. You know, when I when I was setting up my first business and looking for VCs, I was just interested in money. I made a lot of mistakes. I think to Mars's point. When I looked at the marriage in inverted commas um, to the to the investors, um, I think I chose badly and um, and and was a bad partner in that marriage <laughs> from some perspectives. Not I don't think completely bad, but the point being that um, uh, you know you 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 should check out people's backgrounds and there's this kind of chemistry point as well as an experience point um, that may that may actually help or add value. And it may not be the type that you uh, think. Uh, for example, just because you're an entrepreneur in a sector, um, you know, why does that mean that you want to have an empathetic entrepreneur? Um, you may actually want uh, a different mindset and someone who challenges you. Um, and I think that's the point that you made, really, Michael, at the top of the top of the call, uh, top of this question is, um, I very much underappreciated just what an experienced investor with not much entrepreneurial background can bring uh, by asking the dumb wise questions. By just being um, challenging you uh, in a in a constructive way um, to to get where you want, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, you're very much independently minded. You want to change the world. You want to change it on your terms. You're excited about um, your vision, and that's how it should be. You know, uh, you, you, that's 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 why entrepreneurs exist. Um, but there is other points of view, and those points of view you may not like. You may not like to hear. They may not be right, um, but to be challenged like that in a way where everyone's trying to get to the same goal, and, and, and I think I very much underappreciated that extra bit of value add, just from an experienced investor, just full stop. Um, and, and it may be something that, frankly, you know, you guys don't until your second or third time entrepreneurs, um, or, or raising your second lot of funding, or, or, or maybe don't ever appreciate or, or value at all. But I'd put it out there that I think it is, you know, just having good people around who've, who've been there um, and made a lot of money um, on one side of the fence or another um, is usually a, a good sign. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of the time entrepreneurs, if you know, if they've just first time raising money, number one, it can be daunting, right, and super exciting. There's, you know, a very strong temptation to accept the first offer. Um, but I think, mm. you know, a lot of these companies have more negotiating power than they than they kind of realize going into it. Um, to your point, Dan, it's, you know, it's important to hold out for an agreement with the investors, not, you know, not only on the commercial or whether they understand the business or not, but those who can kind of provide the right support guidance, um, whether that's on kind of seeking advice on strategy, financial or kind of product based um, discussions. Right. Um, you know, you've got to really feel comfortable with who you're getting into bed with because it's it's a it's a long 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 term relationship. Yeah, great, great. And uh, just to kind of elaborate a bit more on the on that relationship, um, uh, I'd, I'd like Dan, Dan, if you may, if you could if you could sort of run through us um, what you would say VCs are really looking for at the different stages um, of the process. Yeah, it's a really good question, a really open question. So I'll try and kind of uh, pick a few a few points. Um, so. The, you know the early doors we have check boxes if you imagine what we do in our dashboards I think this is just very healthy in life in general is not just putting yourself in someone's shoes but going beyond that what are the decisions they're making what are the constraints that even if they wanted to they couldn't cross um, what are their accountabilities and responsibilities um, and you can ask you don't even have to do background research you if you ask people they will tell you um, and um, uh, and from early stage VCs, um, some of them have tax driven um, uh, boxes to check. Um, uh, some have, uh, uh, you know, obviously stage and sector and all these kinds of things. Um, some will write long due diligence and bring in third parties. Some will do that in house, uh, you know, and there'll be some will be clear about what they want. Some will be have more of a wide, vague remit that they can fulfill. Um, and I think smoke it out. Um, and, um, and, and if you do smoke it out, you, you'll, be, you'll be better. You'll, you'll save your time. Uh, you'll engage with the right people on the right terms more easily. And I think it's something that I didn't do enough of. Um, so um, that's a sort of general point about what VCs are looking for. You know, um, who knows? Go figure it. 
Um, more specifically, um, the different stages of the process. So um, we don't want to be hassled, um, but we don't mind being hustled. Uh, and I know that just sounds like, uh, what's the difference? Um, there's definitely a, f a feeling of a difference. Um, if you're hassled, it's just getting a lot of um, irritating stuff that's not relevant and people not responding to your polite, um, constructive advice for them to um, do something else um, or, or whatever. And I'm always, always try and be, I think most VCs and good VCs will spend time looking at what they get um, and will try to give feedback. You know, on, clearly not all of it will be liked or accepted or right or whatever, but, but we'll, we'll, be, we'll be doing it not to make a point, but to just to be a good citizen. Um, but if that's not respected, then, then that, can be, uh, that can be a bit of a problem. On the other hand, um, people like to be challenged. VCs like to be challenged. You know, we're human beings and we're looking for smart people who don't take no for an answer and who make one plus one equal ten. So, you know, on the right lines, and um, again, this comes down to some, some sort of EQ points as well as IQ points, um, you know, um, hustle people. Um, I've hustled, um, uh, you know, investors before we're ready. Um, so, you know, look, we're going to look like this in a few months. What do you think? Is this for you? Do you know anybody else? Yada, yada, yada. Um, and, 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 and then once you understand their criteria and get to know them a bit more, um, you know, as Mars says, this is a marriage. So, you know, do you, do you, you know, is it an arranged marriage or do you want to, do you want to get to know this, these people? I mean, either can work, so to speak, in, by analogy. But, you know, clearly if you can get to know somebody um, because you've got the time um, and you ask the questions, then, then, then you get more answers. Um, and then I think as the process goes on, you know, VCs are looking to, you know, they've got a funnel to fill. Uh, VCs have got um, cash to invest. Uh, you know, they've got money to invest, so they have to invest. Which it. is harder than um, you if think. It's, named... <laughs> it's harder than, yeah. I mean, everyone says, oh, wow, what a job. You get hundreds of business plans uh, a week or whatever, uh, or a month, um, and, you know, you just pick the best. And, and, and absolutely, it's, it's not. You have to go out looking for the best. They don't usually come to you. They usually come through a network, and I'm sure Mars, you'll talk about about that as well, right? Um, but uh, you know, it's um, if, if you can get inside that mindset and think what it is, um, you'll you'll be doing yourselves a favour. And it's uh, yeah, it's not so easy. <laughs> it's not so easy. Great, wonderful. Um, Mars, I feel like you had something to add there. I was just going to reiterate Dan's point on kind of hustling, I guess, and trying to seek a trusted advisor. Um, that's what I've seen best, right, in terms of trying to... Well, first of all, don't go and pitch your preferred VC first, right? Hone your pitch on others. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't want to go and blow it um, if you haven't necessarily got everything nailed down. Um, so test your, uh, your pitch out on others. You know, again, early stage enthusiasm, drive, um, it's all about the idea, right? Um, interestingly, you know, I've but we, we, we do a lot of work with Index Ventures, for example, right? And we did a bit of a study where we looked into, you know, they had a bit of a bias for kind of U.S. entrepreneurs being more successful, right, at the very early stage from a pitching perspective. Um, they actually looked into it and are trying to kind of address the bias. But it, generally, a lot of it comes down to, you know, how open and how bombastic Americans are compared to kind of Europeans when they're when they're pitching, right? Um, you know, put someone from Texas pitching in a room with someone from Finland, right? They're going to be completely different pitches. Um, so you know, hone your hone your pitch. Don't go to your preferred VC first if you've identified them based on some of the kind of the metrics Dan mentioned, whether it's you know their expertise, check size, focus, whatever. Um, hone your pitch. Definitely, you know. Going through a trusted advisor as opposed to a broker at early stages, I think is pretty important. Um, but when I say trusted advisor, you know, it could be as simple as getting on LinkedIn, you know, seeing if you're connected to any other investors, can they make any introductions, um, things like that, right? As, the reason, you know, I, the feedback I get around brokers is that typically at early stage, they might not kind of show the unvarnished truth um, to investors and might dress things up a bit more that gets kind of found out Further, further along the line, so it ends up kind of wasting a lot of time, effort of people. Um, definitely go through the trusted, kind of if you know someone who can connect you with investors, hey, you know, that could be someone like me or some, someone like Dan. I'm sure we're more than happy to kind of take calls, conversations afterwards. Um, but definitely, you know, 
figure out who you have in your network that's connected and, and kind of tap them up as, a, as, as the first kind of approach. And don't dismiss the unsolicited approach, right? I know these VCs get, you know, they potentially get thousands of kind of emails, pitches a year, right? But in general, what I've seen is these guys have teams, like from a pipeline perspective, they will go through the emails. It typically will take a lot longer than going through someone trusted who can connect you to partners and founder level. Um, but they are, you know, they are looked at. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with sending kind of going to, some, to VC's website and going through that, that process, right? Otherwise, how else are you going to be? And look out for events as well. That's something, you know, I know that's something NetSuite's been very big on as a kind of a VCP practice. Um, you know, any forum where VC investors, directors are brought together to impart a bit of advice, knowledge in terms of fundraising, expectations, and so on, um, get into those rooms, right? Because these, you know, if you're thinking from an investor perspective, like you said, Dan, you guys are building a pipeline. You've got to go out and find the best business, right? You've got to win it because it's super competitive. Um, you know, VC investors want to meet proprietary owners of businesses. You know, they don't want to be speaking with with brokers, with um, IBs, with banks. With the, they don't want it. They want to meet the founder. They want to. They're investing in the people. Um, so try and get to those, as many of those events as possible. Um, a lot of them are free. A lot of the NetSuite events that we put on are free, and you know we have. Um, kind of key top VCs attending those regularly. Um, so that's just you know a couple of tips in terms of approaching. Great. And do you have any other tips for um, secure that securing those funding? I think look when you're pitching. I, I spoke with uh, investment director Tim Ray at um, BGF a while ago, and he, he, we kind of started talking about the the great pitches he's seen, the worst pitches he's seen. I think, look, you've got to know your audience, right? So to Dan's point, everyone has a different background. Everyone has a different set of experiences. A lot of the time, you know, VCs are looking to bring on board entrepreneurs who have done it before, who have kind of been successful and ex exited and now are kind of moving into the VC space. Um, so know your audience, um, you know, and tailor, tailor the the pitch to that, right? Quite often entrepreneurs are focused on, on their problems, right, of raising money, um, and they don't really take the time to consider the problems of Dan who's trying to get rid of money, right? <laughs> so it sounds like it should be easy, but it's actually not. Um, so I think know your audience, tailor the pitch. Um, don't pitch the guys that you want to invest first, definitely. That's, if there's one piece of advice, that's what I would say. Dan, I wonder those uh, do those sentiments kind of um, echo uh, what what you've seen on both sides of the market. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's uh, it's pretty picking up Mars's point. Is you know I would I would I would sort of frame it like treat it like a normal sales process. It amazes me that uh, people selling a bit of their business, which is what fundraising is, don't treat it the same as they're selling their product. Um, and okay, there are clear differences, but there are clear similarities. And the irony is. Um, you know, when you're pitching your product, if it's a technology product, to um, a new prospective buyer, that new prospective buyer probably doesn't have a budget for it, doesn't really even perceive the need for it uh, overtly, um, if you're creating or unlocking a need, um, or has already got something existing, if you've got something new widget, you know, because if it's a big problem, he's got some, he or she's got some solution to it. Whereas with a VC, they got money and they want to spend it or they want to invest it. So, you know, it's ironically, um, you know, it's a sales process where you know that the, in inverted commas, budget exists. Um, so, yeah, all the points that we've both covered really is, is and think about it like that, create a, uh, a funnel. I agree with Mars that, you know, have a, um, a friendly contact just like you would in a sales environment to help you shape your pitches. It may well end up being someone that does, of course, invest in your business and uh, you're going to learn from that person and shape it. And um, when you are, yeah, cold approaches, I get cold approaches, and if they, um, being very frank, nearly, well, probably over 90% of everything we do come through um, a trusted partner or, 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 or connection or something, which plays to Mars's point. That is the, the reality. But we do look at all things very seriously that come in, and when I do get a cold pitch, if it's just like a cold sales pitch, 
if, it, if it's relevant, if it's thought through, if somebody understands things, the world from my point of view and why I should be interested or my firm, um, then it uh, makes me sit up and take notice, as well as being quite impressed um, that someone has cut through the noise um, and shows sort of signs of good marketing. Um, so, you know, there's these kinds of um, tips that I think people would be mindful of um, when they uh, when they are approaching uh, uh, fundraising, and of course the the thing with fundraising that different uh, that does discriminate it. Uh, the other thing that discriminates it from running a sales pipeline is that with a sales pipeline you want your buyer to buy. With venture capital, you actually want to create more than one buyer to buy. Just like when you're exiting a company, you know the irony is that get us hungry, um, get us um, uh, you know, FOMO, um, get us, uh, and also because the VC world is quite weird that we collaborate. Um, even at the early stage, we syndicate with other funders, um, and, and certainly later stage, of course, um, Series A, it's almost de rigueur in, in most uh, geographic markets um, to share risk, to share ideas. You know, people are competing for deals, but um, but then they don't want to be left out, and you know, if you sh share deals, etc. So, you know, think about that dynamic because that will drive a good value for you, um, and you may get a va uh, an investor who who you really wanted to come in uh, because of value add, and they've been sitting on the fence, and suddenly you've got a lead investor. Um, what works really well obviously depends on your needs, but uh, you might get a corporate investor, um, someone in your sector that can really unlock. Um, a particular market or, or, what, or, or partnership opportunity commercially. Um, and then that sort of triggers the institutional investor to come in or vice versa, because usually most corporate investors are actually not leaders. But, um, uh, you know, if you get their passive interest, it might attract, you know, the other way around, etc. So, you know, that's another dynamic to think about when you're running your, um, you're running your process. And, and of course, if you're afraid of rejection, you know, you shouldn't be an entrepreneur, but I guess uh, you're probably not at this stage because you will get um, a lot of doors slammed in your face, but um, you know, take that on the chin and, 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 and run the pipeline. Yeah, Dan, just on that last point, I couldn't agree more. And, and VCs get it wrong as well, right? You know, if you look, there's, there is a yeah. you know, list of billion dollar companies now where you know, some of the most famous VCs, Bessemer, you know, one of the biggest VCs in the world, has, has published an anti-portfolio, right? Those kind of unicorns <laughs> that they decided not to invest yeah. in. I think um, there's a quote somewhere, on eBay, um, the partner there saying, "What well, you want me to invest in books and stamps and coins? You know, not a chance, <laughs> right? And uh, keep going, keep going. They get it wrong as well. Great. Um, and just a, just a couple of uh, well, billion dollar questions. Um, and there's something, um, uh, Marge, you drew on the, earlier. So you, you mentioned um, uh, investors can dress up sometimes. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to know, um, what, what does a perfect VC partner look like? I think the perfect VC partner. You know, has to has to really understand the, the the business, the vision. You know, has to share the vision. I think you have to be aligned in terms of the expectations and what the VC is going to bring to the table. Um, you know, if you are looking for someone to provide cash and only cash, you know, make that clear, right? Otherwise, it's going to be a source of frustration further on. Obviously, the product or the service has to kind of address a market, right, and solve a customer's problem or challenge um, but a lot of the time at the early stages you know the VCs are there to support you work a lot of those questions out right it's only really when you start kind of getting to kind of series B and series C where you know risk appetite decreases slightly and it's not more you know it's no longer really an experiment it's more about taking something that's successful and expanding and growing rapidly right whether that's international whether that's new markets and so whatever um, so I think make sure that you're aligned in terms of expectations and how they're going to leverage um, and how you can leverage them to support you guys. We've touched on a, on a lot of different areas, um, but I know you know some VCs have very dedicated and specialized teams right around pricing strategy or an investor who only invests in SaaS businesses, for example, can help you kind of think that model through. Um, so just make sure the expectations are aligned um, and really leverage and, you know, Push them to leverage their networks, their their trusted partnerships, like NetSuite's venture capital practice. Right? Um, that that's you know that's my piece of advice. I think to anyone looking for funding, nail who you want to get funding from. You know, be clear um, around who and the why. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dan, Dan, maybe I'll, we could pass the same question to you, and please don't say yourself. 
<laughs> okay, I'll say the next best uh, answer. Um, the um, no, the perfect the perfect fit is really building on Mars's Mars's point is actually uh, for the for the for the entrepreneur to know thyself, right? Because if the entrepreneur is self-aware about themselves, uh, their team mix, uh, their company, um, then they're more likely, just like in life, to uh, ask the right questions, uh, to show the right uh, strengths and weaknesses of themselves. Um, uh, and, and, you know, there is no such thing as perfection in anything, right? But to, uh, um, you know, it's just by that process of knowing yourself um, to, uh, to sort of, you know, bump into and, and make something muddle through. Of the one thing that I think is the key thing, I'll pick up on Mars's point, it's, it's alignment. You know, uh, if you're all from different backgrounds and places, that's usually a thing to celebrate and points of view, uh, but you have to be aligned. What's the key exit time scale? You know, that one really doesn't get enough rigor because sometimes entrepreneurs just tell VCs what VCs want to hear um, just to get the money and then you know it turns out they have very different ideas or expectations or none at all they're just saying what they've been trained to to get money um, and just be honest because there's lots of funders out there and there's a whole range of uh, spectrum of uh, fund life cycles some family money um, that I know doesn't even have any exit time frames at all you know they're very long-term investors which might suit some people and then there's some tax-driven investments and other things which have you know, sort of classic three-year cycles, you know, et cetera. So, you know, perfection comes from, you know, knowing yourself um, and advertising the reality, you know, and obviously in the best possible light. Excellent, good. And, uh, and Dan, we'll come back to you again. Um, so what, what's, what's that perfect VC looking for? <laughs> well, I would say exactly uh, the same advice to the VCs <laughs> because it's um, – you know, it really is not about the perfect VC or the perfect entrepreneur. It's about the perfect relationship, right? That's really what we're saying here. Um, and that relationship comes out of, uh, you know, VCs being clear on what they want, advertising that clarity um, and, and for that relationship to, to flourish. And, and I'm afraid to say it, we're all guilty of not knowing ourselves as well as we should, um, changing the rules slightly, bumbling around, you know, we're all guilty. So it's just a question of, um, you know, if if uh, if if people stick to that sort of idea, uh, you know, relationships tend to tend to work well. Wonderful, thanks. And and Dan, any thoughts on that? Um, I'll, I'll just reiterate. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll just reiterate um, the points made. It's it, it's all about alignment, right? And setting expectations nice, clear, and early on. I think um, to avoid any heartache further down the line. I also think, you know, VCs will help you when you go to raise more funding, right? Because they've, you know, if they're in the mix, they they do it regularly, they can kind of, kind of, you know, if the first funding round was difficult, hopefully once you have investors, you know, they, they can kind of smooth the second, third, fourth rounds um, and be introducing you to the right investors at the right times and so on. So they can really start kind of help, help you think through diligence and moving forward and future exit plans and so on, which is great as well. Wonderful. Actually, can I just jump in on that? I think. Oh, sorry, sorry, Michael. Sorry, I'll just jump leap on that because I think that we've we've probably overlooked quite a key point um, that Mars has just made there, which is, you know, for every pound that an investor invests, they usually want to have three or four up their sleeve um, to follow on. Um, and this is from the funder's selfish point of view. Sorry, I think this is a key point. Yeah. Um, because, you know, coming in and then you back your winners, right? So, unfortunately, the life, the reality is that most of the things you invest in will be uh, either failures or, or, or not great outcomes. Uh, but you want to back your winners. Um, and from the entrepreneur's point of view, understanding, to Mars's point, that the, 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 the uh, venture capital companies that can follow on or introduce them later on, so they're not all scrambling around, that's a big headache that they can solve. Um, big source of value, of course, um, as well. So, yeah, I do think that uh, that's probably one thing from one of your earlier questions. Well, it's probably in all of your questions uh, relevant. Mm. Certainly a theme running through there. I completely agree. Thanks for bringing that up, Dan. Uh, so just tuning to um, uh, questions from our audience, I'm quite wary of time. Um, we've, we've had one, one question come through that's particularly interesting, I think, um, and quite timely. Um, so, so, Dan, perhaps uh, we can come to you first with that. Um, so it's, uh, what, what are your thoughts on entrepreneurs who are looking more to the crowdfunding solution instead of the traditional VCPE route? Yeah, 
So look, if you're an entrepreneur, you know, and, and you want easy money, uh, t- you know, take it. Um, and, you know, if there is a source of easy money and that's what you want, then, you know, we can all wax lyrical and, and, and give you moral guidance and all that nonsense. But, you know, you, you just take it at the best possible price. Um, for me, crowdfunding is, you know, we've used it, we've co-invested with it. So I ca- need to be careful what I say, but there are some problems that we've seen. Um, very long shareholder lists that you then can't do anything that's that paralyze the company. Bad governance where, you know, entrepreneurs get up to no good, not because they're naughty, but just because there's uh, no real governance and, um, you know, things get really out of hand and that disappoints everybody. Um, just bad pricing because, uh, you know, every entrepreneur wants the best price that they want to come in on. But then because it wasn't really realistic, there's a down round and then another down round and, you know, it just screws everything up. Um, and, um, you know, so sometimes what I would call soft money um, is um, is not good uh, news. Um, but, you know, clearly I'm trying to see both sides of it, not taking any particular high ground. Um, I recognize that, you know, it, it exists. So, yeah, just just the eyes open, um, really, and just try and talk around about, you know, the reality of crowdfunding before. The other thing is it may well get shut down. Uh, some things may get shut down from a regulatory point of view because there are some quite public um, issues. But, uh, yeah, both sides, two sides of that coin. Excellent. Good. Thank you, Dan. And Morris, any, anything to add there? Um, I'll, I would approach it from a slightly different perspective so yeah to dan's point if 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 you know if all you need is the money right and it's quick and easy fine right that does cause you know can potentially cause issues for uh, investors down the line right how they think through kind of shareholding and so on uh, as dan mentioned but i would also like to bring the other aspect that's not necessarily a, a hey don't do it you know the entrepreneur don't crowdfund but i would all i would kind of approach it from a moral side of things that is to say a lot of the people investing through crowdfunding platforms are retail investors they're less a lot less sophisticated from a financials perspective they won't go through the same diligence as a VC firm for example and often they end up paying a huge you know a very large price for what they're getting um, relative to what a, a VC would have would have done if they had the same information and the same diligence and so on. Um, so yeah, to, to Dan's point, it's two sides of you know two sides to the coin. I guess it's an option if you know if you don't want your VC. I you know I'm from the school of thoughts that you know VC can bring a lot to the table beyond money. And actually, you know if you've got a, a fast growing business, then you know the money raising the money is going to be the easier part, right? It's it's more about who you're raising it from and what they're going to bring to the table. Um, on the crowdfunding piece, I would just question whether, you know, the valuations and, and the kind of the retail investor ex, um, expertise going into those kind of investments, but that's, you know, you know, not, not the entrepreneur's um, main problem, I imagine. Well, good stuff. Uh, that's that's just about us for time-wise um, today and um, uh, some really useful information. Um, from our panelists, I certainly learned a lot, and uh, hopefully entrepreneurs and others looking for funding have, as I'm sure um, uh, some of our VC audience. Uh, we'll wrap things up there, but you'll see on your screen now the uh, the on-demand link, um, in which you can listen to the webinar in full or in part again, um, or share with with colleagues or friends. Uh, thank you, Mars, for joining us. Thank you very much, and thank you, Dan. Thank you. Uh, This is the County Countency Age. I'm Michael McCaw signing off. Thank you.